Well, this morning, let's take our Bibles and let's turn to where we are in the book of Nehemiah. It's chapter 13, uh, and this will be the last time we are in this book together uh, as far as a verse-by-verse study of the book. And if you like to take notes in your bulletin, you can find an outline that's provided for you that will help you uh, just follow along and make sure you understand where we are and what we're learning from our text. This book of Nehemiah is a book that's been two parts in one sense. The first six chapters about the rebuilding of the wall, because that was Nehemiah's task to do first, was to bring the people back from the captivity and restore those broken down walls. So chapters one through six, he's the main character and he's leading the way and the people uh, helping them to put that wall back together. But there was something more needed than just a physical wall put up and that was their lives to be restored and rebuilt. So from chapters seven through chapter 12, over the last few weeks, we have been looking at this section and it really is about God reviving the people and restoring them to a deep love and a deep passion for him. And just so you know what's happening as we come to chapter 13, it's good to remind ourselves of what revival looked like in their lives and what it looks like in our lives as God is working in us by his spirit through his word to reignite a hunger and a love for him in a way that maybe had been lost. And so in chapter 8 of Nehemiah, we saw how God's people began to radically hunger for the word. When God revives us, that is what happens. And this was a, a serious hunger, as we said, six hours of standing on their feet while the word of God was read and explained and applied to their lives. And they didn't just do it for one day. They did it for straight seven days. That's the kind of hunger they had. Secondly, we learned that when revival took place in their day and in our hearts as well, we find that God's people become serious about their sin and they're humbly confessing it before God. It's no longer, look at those people. Can you believe those people are living like that? It's now, look at me, look at my sin, look at my heart, look at what's wrong with me, God, and you need to change in me. That is the result of truly getting in the Word. When you get into the Word of God, it's not simply to increase your knowledge, it's to transform you as a believer. And that comes with confession and acknowledgement and humility before God. The third thing we learned in chapter 10 uh, was that when God is reviving, his word is working, you're confessing sin, and you find yourself dedicating all that you are and all that you have to God and his purposes. I mean, you know it. I mean, Brian reminded us that this morning. You know that absolutely that God gave you everything you have and he owns everything you have, but you forget that. And when you're revived and your heart is awakened and stirred again, you just find that fresh awareness of saying, God, it really is not mine. It's all yours. And I want to use it for you and for your purposes. And then last week, we finished up in chapters 11 and 12, seeing how that when God's people are revived, his word is working, confession and humility is taking place, dedication and, and devotion to God is rising to the top again. And people are saying, you know what, we're all involved in doing the work of ministry. Everybody is stationed around the wall, there are various jobs, some out in the field, some in the city, but everybody has a place designed by God to do and accomplish the work. It's not that Nehemiah and Ezra or the leaders in any era or time do it all and everybody watches. We take various roles and different responsibilities of ministry in order to accomplish those things. And together, we God's people accomplish the work of ministry. Now, that leads us to chapter 13. Because you need to note as we open up chapter 13, these first words in verse 1. On that day. Now, why is that significant? Well, because somewhere in your margins and your notes, you want to make sure that you make some kind of reminder to yourself that from the end of chapter 12 to the end of chapter 13, over 10 years has, has taken place. And it didn't take us a second to jump from the end of chapter 12 to chapter 13. But historically, in the timeline, at least 10 years, maybe even 14 years have transpired. And so when he says, on that day, he's marking a significant moment of something that has happened. And not only is it 10 to 14 years later from chapter 12, chapter 12 ends with this great excitement and revival that has been going on. And, and, and it's such a noise of loudness, as we saw at the end of chapter 12, that all their neighbors heard them celebrating how joyous it was to love God and to follow God. But as we move from chapter 12 to chapter 13, it goes from revival to some rebellion. It goes from 
continuing with the Lord as they did in chapter 12 to becoming cold and callous again to some things that were pretty obvious that they should have been doing and kept on doing. And so a lot changes on that day in chapter 13, verse 1. And not only has this happened that it is a span of time from chapter 12 to 13, the context is now a sad chapter in one sense and a challenging chapter in the life of the people of God, but Nehemiah is also 70 years old. I don't know about you, but I imagine that in most people's minds, by the time you get to that age, you're about done with your battles, right? <laughs> you just kind of feel like you've already put in your work. You've served the Lord. You've done those things. You've fought things and, and dealt with sin enough. It's kind of like the golden years of your Christian life, and it just should be something of, of real interest. Well, I want to just kind of set the stage for you to think about these things as we come to chapter 13 to kind of show you something that's kind of unique to growing old. And some of you are going to immediately identify this and know what I'm talking about. But we have this strange idea, this funny sense in which we think about growing old. Uh, I read uh, this article this week, and I want to share a little piece of it with you. It was kind of a humorous and unique way of how people look at ages and stages of life. And the article went like this. Do you realize that the only time in our lives when we like to get old is when we are kids? If you're less than 10 years old, you are so excited about aging that you think, it, you think of it in fractions. How old are you? You might ask them. I'm five and a half. I'll be six in three weeks. Do you realize that you are never 36 and a half? No, you are five and a half, and you're going to be six in three weeks. The article goes on and says, then you get into your teens, and you now know one, and, and now no one can hold you back. You literally jump to the next number. You ask them, how old are you? I'm going to be 16. Now, you could be 14, but you will say, I'm going to be 16 eventually. <laughs> then the great day of your life, you become 21. Even the words sound like a ceremony. You become 21. But then you turn 30. What happened there? You turned 30? It makes you sound like bad milk, right? <laughs> he turned 30, so we had to throw him out. <laughs> what changed? You became 21, but you turned 30. Then you're pushing 40, right? You reach 50. You become 21, you turn 30, you're pushing 40, you reach 50, then you make it to 60. <laughs> but then you have built up so much speed, you hit 70. Then you are just simply in your 80s. <laughs> At that stage, you're not even willing to buy green bananas because they are too much of an investment in the future. <laughs> it doesn't end there. The article goes on to say, once you are in the 90s, you start going backwards. How old are you? I was just 92. <laughs> then a strange thing happens. If you make it over 100, you become a little kid again. How old are you? I'm 100 and a half. In fact, in three weeks, I'll be 101. <laughs> now that is an interesting factor about growing old. <laughs> I would love to hear your comments out there. <laughs> but there's another interesting and realistic factor about growing old, and that is this. You tend to think, it's a strange way to think, but you tend to think that your battles and struggles will be less. And the reality is they will be greater. It's like God has reserved some of the most severe trials and challenges for us in life for when we are older. I mean, we would think that it would go like this, you know? Through my Christian walk and through my life as a believer, I've learned to resist sin. I've learned to fight sin. I've gained ground in this area. I've moved on to the next thing. And uh, sooner or later, I've probably got them all kind of dealt with, and I'll kind of have an easy road as I move into those final years of my life. But the reality is, and you know this if you're honest, some of those things that you've triumphed over come back. Some of those victories and battles you have won come back and you fight them over and over and over. And that's exactly what's happening here as we come to Nehemiah 13. 
A decade has transpired between these two chapters. Nehemiah is 70 years old, and Nehemiah is fighting sin that is returned into the life of God's people in just 10 short years. This is an odd way for me, in one sense, to think of ending a book. Because you would think that after chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, great revival, God is doing great things in the people, and they are extremely in love with God, that you just end the book right there. But what Nehemiah is showing us is that this is a pattern too often and too commonplace for the people of God. We, we have triumph, we have victory, a sense of closeness to the Lord, and we think all will just kind of be good from that point on. And yet what's happening here in Nehemiah 13 is the same thing that happens throughout the Old Testament. Revival and then uh, a need for repentance. Revival, repentance, and a continual rebellion and falling away from the things of God. There's a whole book in the Old Testament, by the way, called the Book of Judges that shows seven cycles where the children of Israel would be revived and then they would rebel. A judge would be raised up, call them back to repentance to God. And so it's nothing new in the Old Testament. It's definitely nothing new in the New Testament life of believers. There's always a time in which we have to realize that even as we grow older, the battle doesn't lessen and the challenges are just as real and just as, as strong for us as Christians. And you know, the tendency is, like a lot of things when you get old, you just kind of want to forget about stuff. You don't want to have to deal with those things anymore. And that's what we cannot do as believers as we come to a passage like this. It shows us just what it looks like to really never, no matter what, give up. To not lose heart. And the New Testament warning is for us to not lose heart, but to endure. For in due season we'll reap if we, what? Faint not, if we don't quit. And so Nehemiah is coming now at the end of these years of his life, 70 years of age, the people of God have slipped back into some things that are sin and problems in their life. And he's going to show us how that even at this stage of life, he didn't give up, but he fought those things. He dealt with those things. He helped the people around him to continue moving forward and not losing heart and not fainting when it comes to these things. So what we're going to do as we break the chapter up is we're going to look at four problems that they face, problems that I think you'll find we face as well. And then we're going to look at the four plans that he implemented to deal with those struggles as this ongoing battle with sin and, and tribulations and trials came to him. Here's the first one I want you to look at in verses 1 through 9. Let's look at the problem that's outlined in verses 1 through 7. I'll read for you. So on that day, they read aloud from the book of Moses. This is like saying they read the Bible, okay? In the hearing of the people, and there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. Now, this is a clear reminder to them already in the Bible, and it's back in Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 through 5. God had clearly put in his word, no Ammonite or Moabite can ever have a place in the Jewish worship system or in the temple. So verse 2, why did God do that? Is he just kind of like some people and he hates other people? No, look what verse 2 says. Because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Now, you remember the story back in the Old Testament? How that, uh, that the, uh, Balaam came as a false prophet and, and told the Ammonites and the Moabites how to deceive, as it were, the children of Israel. And the plan was to intermarry with them. If, if you can just get them to marry uh, your daughters who are not believers, who are pagans, then you can tear this, this nation apart. And they won't be loyal to their God. And so Balaam advised the Moabite king that to do this would be the way to have victory. But if you look at verse 3... It says, or verse 2, rather, the rest of verse 2, however, our God turned the curse into a blessing. What they meant for evil, God used for their good. And so God ultimately led them to not follow that uh, Moabite uh, king and the gods that he wanted to bring into their world. And he didn't want them as unbelievers to ever have this in their midst again because these were people who would always be an allurement away from God and the things of God. 
Now, uh, just to say a little side note, it's important, I think, to say this. That is not to say that no Moabite could ever be in the family of God, okay? You'll remember the story, one book of the Old Testament, who bears her name, Ruth, was a Moabite. She, she became a believer, and she's welcomed in. But those who were unbelievers, this partnership, this coming together was always a forbidden thing for the children of Israel. And so, look if you look at verse 3 and following, it says, So when they heard the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. Verse 4. Now prior to this, Eliashib, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to, here's our guy again, Tobiah. Remember him back in the beginning of the book of Nehemiah? He was the guy who hated Nehemiah, hated the plans of God, did everything he could to stop that wall going up, made all kind of tales and lies about Nehemiah, and was really one of his big enemies. Now watch what has happened with Tobiah. They had his relative who he's kin to, Elisha the priest, had prepared a large room for him where formerly they had put the grain of offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, the tithes of grain, wine and oil prescribed for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priest. Now stop right there. So you see what's happening? Elisha the, the priest here has set up an apartment for Tobiah in the temple. Took all that stuff out of that room. They used to hold all the offerings and the grains. And they put this troublemaker, this Ammonite, in this room right where the Jewish people would gather to worship. So look at verse 6. Verse 5, rather. But during all this time, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king. So here's the idea. Nehemiah left Artaxerxes, the king, came to lead the people to rebuild the wall. At some point, he goes back for a visit to see Artaxerxes, and while he's away, these things are happening. Uh, Elisha, the priest, has set up an apartment <laughs> with stuff for uh, Tobiah. Verse 7. And I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. So let's just pause right there and think about what this challenge is and this problem is. And the word I would put in there is compromise. So what Nehemiah is seeing now is that Elisha, the priest, the leader, is compromising something that is pretty clear in the scriptures. No Ammonite, no Moabite can ever be in the dwelling of the people of God. Not if they become a believer, they can. Ruth was one of those. But this unbelieving folks and people could not be a part of this worship. One author said it this way, Inviting Tobiah to live in, Jewish, in a Jewish temple was like inviting a possum to live in a chicken coop. That's a pretty clear picture, right? And sometimes, brothers and sisters, that's how the enemy works. One author commented, even to this day, Satan does not always fight churches. Sometimes he joins them. And it has to do with compromise. Something pretty clear, pretty obvious, God has said, but you make uh, adjustments and you compromise. Maybe it was easier for Elisha because he's akin to him. He's, he's kind of like family and he overlooks some things. But he was compromising with him. So the problem was just that it was compromise. So let's say what the plan is, verses 8 and 9. What did he do about compromise? What do you do when you face compromise? What do you do with it? Verse 8. It was very displeasing to me, so I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. <laughs> he got him a, well, I don't know, we say you haul I don't know what kind of haul they had then. Might have been a y'all haul. They, they taken that thing out of here, and they got everything that Tobiah had, and he said, get it away from here. I don't want any of his stuff in this place. Then verse 9, it gets even more interesting. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the room, and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. That's my way of understanding what he said is, I want his stuff out of here. Take his razor, take his bathrobe, take his clothes, take his book, take his furniture, take everything the guy has, get it out of the house, and when he's gone, you clean this thing up so much, I don't even smell him anymore. I don't even want the scent of this guy around. So all of that is to picture for us a very important thing of how 
We handle compromise. It's a really simple word, immediately. You don't have discussions about it. You don't say, well, and I think it's really interesting that Nehemiah didn't even say, you know, I know it's going to be hard on you, buddy, <laughs> kicking you out of here, throwing all your stuff out. Uh, if you can find you a place to live in 30 days, then we'll work this out. No compromise, no discussion. Immediately, you're out. We don't deal with this. You know, and that's how we have to deal with that when people compromise. I think I've told you this story before where I um, had to go to someone's home who had shacked up with a woman. He was a married man. He was attending our church at that time, and he was a married man, and he shacked up. And so I went to where he was with this woman, with another leader. I'm not on the door. He came to the door and turned white as a ghost. And he said, uh, uh, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm here to tell you, you got to deal with this immediately, right now. And after a conversation, he said, I'll do it. Uh, I promise you I'll do that. And I said, well, great, let's go in the house and get your stuff now. And he said, no, we can't do that. If I do that, this lady will go ballistic. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you till tomorrow, but I'm coming back if you're not out of here tomorrow. And thank God he got out, and he got back in his marriage. So we don't talk through compromise. We don't discuss possible options. We have to deal with it immediately. There was sin in the camp and a sinner in the temple. And Nehemiah said, this has to happen now. You have to go. You say, well, I don't know any Tobias. I don't have any Moabites or Ammonites living in my house. So, And in my world, how in the world does this apply to me? Well, the principle is pretty clear here. When God clearly speaks something in his word, don't compromise it. Don't delay. If you are compromising, deal with it immediately. Take care of it. Here's a couple examples I want to put up there, a couple passages of scripture. In uh, Paul's writing to the Corinthians, there's two passages where he refers to the temple. And the temple that the New Testament is referring to is not a building like the Old Testament temple or the place of worship. You and I are the temple. We are the temple. And so in this passage in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, he says, Do you not know? I mean, have you kind of lost your mind on this? Don't you remember you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So it's not a building anymore. It's not even this building. He doesn't dwell in this building. He dwells in you and me as believers. We are the temple. And so in this passage, he's referring to all of us as the church and says the church collectively are called God's temple. That's where he lives. That's where he dwells. And then he says to us in another passage in Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? So the church collectively, we are the house of God. We're the temple of God. God dwells in us. In fact, I want you to know, Paul says clearly to the Corinthians, I'm talking about your physical body, you, in your humanity. God has chosen as a believer, for you as a believer, to have him set up his house, his dwelling, and you. You are his temple. Both the church and the body of God are the New Testament temple. So the question is, is how do you and how do I deal with sin that comes into our temple? In us. How do we do that? It's not about a building. It's about you. It's your body. It's your life. How do you do that? Do you set up rooms in your soul for sin and compromise and make excuses for why those things are in your life? Why nobody understands why that's important for you and you have to do it, but you do and you're kind of logicking and reasoning yourself into all kind of disobedience when God's pretty clear about what he says? Maybe you could, to get it more clear, ask yourself the question, have you secretly decorated some room in your soul and invited lust, which is pretty clearly commanded to not do? Have you invited and allowed to set up in your temple, in your life, pride or dishonesty or hypocrisy or anger or jealousy or bitterness? Have you let them move in and like Eliashib, you're kind of okay with it? You need to be like Nehemiah and say, immediately, we got to deal with this right now. That's the first thing that you do. You deal with compromise and any challenge to not fully obey the scripture, you deal with that immediately. Here's the second thing he faced. It's in verses 10 to 14. Let's read uh, verse 10. I also discovered, now I had to pause there for just a moment. You know, it's, it's every verse and every comma and every phrase means something to me. But when I read that, 
it was almost like I could really sympathize with Nehemiah saying, then I also discovered. I mean, it wasn't enough that Tobiah was living there, that we had compromised as God's people a direct, clear teaching of his word, and we were kind of okay with it as a people, but I also discovered something else. <laughs> it's kind of like those moments like, are you kidding me? There's more i got to deal with? There's more that I have to deal with? This had to be a discouraging moment for him. Remember, in chapter 12, they had just left revival celebrating so loudly that the neighbors heard their joy in God. And now he says, and I also discovered this. There was more to have to deal with. So let's read verses 10 to 14 and see what the more is. What is the other issue that he has to deal with? I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, so that the Levites and the singers who performed the services had gone away each to his own field. Okay, so here's what's happening. The Levites, the singers, these are the people in the temple, right? These are the ones whom God has appointed to lead them in worship, to lead them in the things of God. And what the people did is they quit their support of that, and these people had to go back out in the fields and find a job somewhere. Now, why is that important? Well, back in chapter 10, in revival, they gave God all their stuff. They said, it's all yours. It all belongs to you, Lord. Everything we have is yours, and we're going to use it for you and for your purposes. But now, they quit doing that. And the word I put in there is the word selfishness. This stuff is my stuff. I'm going to use it the way I want to use it. And... Um, Maybe if I do get around to it, I'll give some of the leftovers to what God called us to do back in chapter 10. That's just straight up selfishness. I'll give you an illustration. Let's just imagine, it's not going to happen, so it's, it's not going to happen. But let's just imagine you're going to get Jesus in the flesh to show up at your house for dinner this week. He's coming over and you're going to have some killer food, right? And you're going to enjoy the bounty and the blessing of all that's been provided. And you're there and you're eating and you're telling Jesus, this is awesome stuff. This is good. Uh, it's amazing. It's the best stuff we've ever had. I've never had a meal like this. And in fact, I, I, I was just telling you how great it is. And just in a minute, I want you to taste some of this. And you do the whole meal. Enjoy the meal. Take all that you can of the meal. And when you're done, you say, would you like some? And you give him the leftover, the last portion. That's kind of what's happening here. And usually when we develop a mentality of selfishness like that about our stuff, honestly, there's probably never any left over. Probably no left over at all. So what did he do? Well, let's talk about his plan in verses 11 to 14. How did he deal with selfishness? Verse 11. So I reprimanded the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Then I gathered them together and, and restored them to their post. All Judah then brought the tithe of the, of the grain, wine and oil into the storehouses. And then in charge of the storehouse, I appointed, and he lists a whole bunch of folks that he puts back in place. They had gone to work jobs out in the field somewhere. He brings them back. In verse 14, I want you to notice how he says this. Remember me for this, O oh my God, and do not blot out my loyal deeds, which I have performed for the house of my God and its service. So he reprimands them. That was part of the plan. And then he restores. It's not enough to say, you know what, you need to stop being selfish. He then says, here's how we're going to fix that. We're going to deal with selfishness and we're going to go back to what God called us to do. And how did he deal with it? He dealt with it drastically. He dealt with it drastically. When it comes to compromise, you deal with it immediately. Don't give it any time. Do it now. When it comes to selfishness, if you don't drastically deal with selfishness, it will keep growing and it will keep deceiving you and telling you why you're right in doing what you're doing. So you deal with selfishness in a very drastic and a dramatic way. And when he closes out in verse 14, I love what he says here. It's almost like you could reword it this way. Oh, Lord. These people, how agonizing to have to go back down this path again. Lord, please don't forget what I'm trying to do here for your sake and for the sake of your glory. It's not about me. I'm not here selfish, he says. I really care about your glory and your purposes. There's a third thing, and it's found in verses 15 through 22. 
And here's the problem. Let's look at this problem. So they not only have compromise going on, they have selfishness going on. Verses 15 through 22. In those days, I saw in Judah some who were trading or treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading them on donkeys, as well as wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads. And they brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I admonished them on the day they sold food. Also, men on Tyre were living there who imported fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath, even in Jerusalem. Then I reprimanded the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing you are doing by profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do the same, so that our God brought on us and on this city all this trouble? You are adding to the wrath on Israel by performing or by profaning the Sabbath. Came about, he says in verse 19, that just as it grew as it grew dark, and the, at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut. And let's hold there for just a moment. What is the problem that's going on? The word I'd put in there would be the word materialism. So materialism is about them trying to get more stuff. And in this context, they're doing it on the Sabbath. That day became, like any other day, business as usual. Now, let's be clear, we definitely are not under any Old Testament laws of Sabbath observance. I get that. We don't need to wrestle over that. That's not my point to say this. But my point is to say the text is clearly reminding us that we often put pursuit of business and pleasure ahead of worship. We do that. You know, I'm often baffled and confused when I hear people say why they missed worship. And, and not that you can't go somewhere else to worship, but my question always as they're away, so did you go to church there? Did you worship with God's people that day? And sadly, sometimes the answer is no, we just had a family time. Nothing wrong with family time, nothing wrong with pleasure and enjoying the things of life, but there's something wrong. And the text clearly is showing us here that when we start down this path of materialism and stuff and those things, that we tend to really lose sight of the importance of that day we gather to worship. And it's huge for us. I'm not telling you we shouldn't go out to eat. I'm not telling you that some people don't have to work jobs on the Lord's day. I'm not telling you any of those things necessarily. I'm just saying that the text makes it really clear that he is troubled deeply by the fact that that day looked like every other day, except they just kind of squeezed, would squeeze something in for the sake of gathering. And it has to do with materialism. Now, what's his plan? Now, this is where I love my man, Nehemiah. At 70 years of age, just watch what he does. Verses 19. It's not old. I know it's not old. I get that. I'm only a little about far away. 15 years away. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. I'm still a child. I know. So, <laughs> look at verse 19. It came about that just as it grew dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors uh, be shut and that they should not open them until after the Sabbath. In other words, he's locking the city down, right? <laughs> it gets better. Then I stationed some of my servants at the gate so that no load would enter the Sabbath day. Not only am I shutting the door, but if you figure out a way to get in this wall, I got some people watching you to make sure you don't do this. <laughs> and then verse 21. Then I warned them and said to them, Why do you spend the night in front of the wall? If you do so again, I will use force against you. Let me just put that in modern day English. If you try to get in here, I'm going to black your eye. <laughs> I'm not putting up with you. He's a 70 year old man. 60 and 80 will do it too. <laughs> 60 and 80 will do it too. And here he is saying, I will use force against you. I'm going to stop you from doing it. And there's a point here, a very important point. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come 
uh, as gatekeepers to sanctify the Sabbath day. For this also, here's another prayer, remember me, O oh my God, and have compassion on me according to the greatness of your loving kindness. So, how did he deal with materialism? He dealt with it firmly. This is the firm response. When materialism was getting a hold of the people, he firmly said, we're locking the doors, we're putting some people over here to make sure we don't violate this day of worship, and if you get in here, I'm going to black your eye. Uh, uh, no, please don't take this as instructive, okay? <laughs> that we're going to police you about the Lord's Day and worship. And that uh, if, if, if somebody tries to come in and do something, we're going to black their eyes. That's not the point at all. But it is a point to remind us that there's some things you just have to be very firm about. And he was just that in this passage. I want you to note something as we wrap up this one and quickly do the next point. When did Nehemiah pray about this. Verse 22, he prayed about it after he did what he knew he was supposed to do. I think that sometimes when we struggle with sin and the battles and the fights that we have, whatever it is, we tend to keep praying about it. We tend to keep saying, okay, God, help me figure this out. Help me do this. And God is saying, just do it. You know what you're supposed to do. It's pretty clear what you should be doing, and you need to firmly drastically and immediately do something, stop praying about it. If you're praying, God, give me strength, that's one thing. But often the prayer is, God, is this right? Should I do this? Help me. Take the step, and he will help you. So what Nehemiah does, I love this, is he does what's right, and then he prays. God, I want to do this. I want to honor you. I want your loving kindness to be upon me and your greatness to be known. You know, there are some things that you just don't need to say, I've got to pray about this before I do it, because it's pretty clear. You should do it. A couple of passages I just want to throw up there for you. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So here he is targeting the issue of them giving in to sexual sins, sex outside of marriage. And he's saying, this is the will of God, your sanctification. This is what God has given you clearly as his will in his word. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there are tons of people who are praying about, really, trying to figure out whether they should have relationships with somebody or not outside of marriage. It's crazy. They've logicked themselves into a worldly, material, like everybody else in the world, kind of mentality, as if that's kind of okay for them. And the text is really clear. clear. This is God's will. Do I have to pray about it? God, is this your will? No, it's your will. Do it. Just do it. You deal with this kind of stuff firmly. Take a step and do it. Here's one other verse, which I thought since April 15th is coming up real soon, I'd throw that one up. Render to all what is due, them tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, no matter how much you dislike a party, no matter how much you dislike taxes, how much you disagree with it, and that's all good. If you do that, you still pay your taxes. You don't have to pray about it. <laughs> pray all you want, but this is pretty clear, that you are to render your taxes. Voice your opinion, tell your dislikes, write. We all do that. We should do that. We have that freedom under common grace to do that in American culture, and unfortunately enough of us don't do that. But in the end, if that's what it comes down to, you pay your taxes. You pay your taxes. So materialism. Here's the last one, and we're done. Verses 23 through 31. The problem is presented for us in verses 23 and 24. In those days, I also saw. It's like, here's another thing. <laughs> I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. As for their children... Half spoke in the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. Now, this is the intermarrying, again, that's going on. Pagan, lost people, not ethnicity issues, has nothing to do with skin colors, has everything to do with belief systems. And they are unequally yoked, and now Nehemiah says, I have found here that the people are doing something God clearly said not to do. Now, I want to show you an interesting strategy. 
You notice that when they married, they lost their native tongue, right? They couldn't speak Hebrew anymore. And when they couldn't speak Hebrew, guess what? They could not also read the Hebrew Bible. So if you don't understand the language of the scripture, then you won't be clear on what the scripture says. And so here, this, this ploy of intermarrying, bringing in, same thing Ezra had dealt with back, I think, in Ezra chapter 8, and had to deal with this issue of the intermarrying. They are doing it again. It's back again. What's the word I would put there? This one's straight up disobedience. It's not the issue of compromise or selfishness that they just kind of lost their perspective on their stuff or materialism that they were just thinking about getting more and more. And this is straight up disobedience. Straight up disobedience to what God's word says. So that's the problem. What did they do about it? The plan? Verse 25 to 31. Let's read that and conclude. So I contended with them. And cursed them. That doesn't mean they were using bad language. He's saying God is going to punish this. Okay. So I cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair. Again, a 70-year-old guy. <laughs> not, only, not only will he put people at the wall to watch you. And if you get by and black in your eye. Now on this one, I'm going to jerk your hair out of your head. This is some serious, serious response to disobedience. Serious, and it should be. I mean, when Jesus said to the New Testament believers, if your right eye offends you, or your right hand, in the context of lust, he said, pluck your eye out and cut your hand off. Now, he didn't literally mean pluck your eye out and cut your hand off. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is, your actions are going to be drastic when it comes to sin and possibly disobey. Do that. So, verse 26, so I contended with them and cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, you shall not give your daughters to the sons nor take, or take of their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the many nations, there was no king like him. And he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. He's just saying, listen, don't think you are above this kind of sin. Even this great man, Solomon, whom God loved, the wisest man in the world, gave in to this and fell to it. So verse 27, do we then hear about you that you have committed all this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women. Even one of the sons of jo Joada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law of Sanballat, the Hornite. So I drove him away from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defi defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I purified them from everything foreign and appointed duties for the priest and the Levites, each in his task. So what did he do? How did he deal with this disobedience? Severely. <laughs> severely. This is severe. You don't play around with clear disobedience to something that God has clearly told us to do. So whether it's compromise, you handle it immediately. Selfishness, drastically. Take drastic measures to stop that. Leave it to itself, it'll only grow bigger. Materialism, deal with it firmly. Disobedience, severe actions. Severe actions. So let's wrap it up and just think of a couple applications here as we get ready to close in song. I think the text is reminding us here that in this life, God does not provide final victory over sin. I don't care how old you are whether you've been a believer for a year or for 50 or 60 or 70 years, God does not promise final victory over sin right now in this life. Don't think as you get older, you reach some point to where you're done and the battle is over. It's a fight to the very end. One, our greatest test of faith is going to always be the next one. Always. So do not rest on your laurels. Past victories do not guarantee future victories. So uh, 
Just because you begin well like they did in the revival time of Nehemiah doesn't mean you end well. There's no final victory over sin in this life. Our greatest test as a believer is just around the corner. So the question is, are you going to retreat in the battle you are in as hard as it is? Are you going to quit? Are you going to give up? Or are you going to be like Nehemiah and fight right to the very end? That's the first application. Second application is this. Temptation in the believer's life does not diminish with age. The battles that Nehemiah fought, the battles that the people of his similar age were fighting here, didn't diminish just because of age. I love what James Montgomery Boyce wrote in his commentary on Nehemiah. He said, the Christian life is hard work. Even the Bible recognizes it as hard work by describing it as a battle, 1 Timothy 6, 12, where it says, fight the good fight of faith. It's pictured as a race in 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have finished the race. It's pictured as a sacrifice in Romans 12, 1. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Boris goes on to write, Bible study is hard, prayer is hard, witnessing is hard, living a holy life in the midst of temptation is extremely difficult. Jesus Christ promised his followers not a comfortable life, but a cross. That's what he promised. You might feel like quitting, like giving up, but you and I must persevere until Jesus returns. That is the call. In other words, you can't resign from the fight. You can't go back to those childhood days where life seems simple. You have to persevere and fight to the very ending. Can I get you just to look at the closing verse of Nehemiah? And that's how Nehemiah ends his book and how he tells us he wants to be remembered Remember me, oh my God, for good. This was his greatest passion in life. It's him saying, Lord, I want to live life so that when you think of me, you will have a good thought about me. When you observe my ways and my choices and my lifestyle, you'll be pleased with me. That I fall, that I never gave up, that I kept on persevering by grace, by your, your word and by the strength that you provided each of those challenges. That's the story of Nehemiah. That's how he ends his life. And that's the question as we end the book of Nehemiah. Is that how we end? Right to the very end. Persevering, fighting, never giving up. Not losing heart. Not coming unstrong as it were. And failing to serve those purposes that God has called us to. That's my prayer that as we wrap this up, we'll listen to the warning, listen to the caution at the end. And never give up. No, never, ever give up. Let's pray.